Every year, thousands of construction workers are seriously injured in America. Construction workers find themselves confronted by dangerous, unsafe work conditions on a daily basis. There are laws and regulations to protect all workers, whether they are iron workers, construction workers, electricians, mechanics, bricklayers, painters, or carpenters. However, these laws and regulations can be very difficult for the injured worker to navigate without the help of experienced construction lawyers. Sherlegate is one of Texas and America's premier construction accident law firms. These lawyers with hard hats have a long and proud tradition of representing laborers of all kinds who have been injured on the job. They are well versed in labor law and have recovered tens of millions of dollars on behalf of injured workers. The firm has also represented union and non-union workers, laborers, electricians, carpenters, sheet metal workers, plumbers, iron workers, and steam fitters. They also represent documented as well as undocumented workers. Today, the Insider Exclusive Investigative News Team takes an inside look at the Texas law firm of Share Legate with one of its founders, Jim Share, in a network TV special, Construction Safety, Santos Rodriguez story. Examining the firm's outstanding record for seeking justice for workers injured on the job that matches none. On or about March 11, 2008, Santos was working with his employer, Southwestern Roofing, on a roofing job using hot molten tar for a new roof on the U.S. government port of entry building along the U.S.-Mexican border. Santos was severely injured when a Cleesby manufactured high-low bar tar lugger exploded outward through the fill valve and sprayed hot molten roofing tar over 26 feet, covering his body and causing severe and extensive grotesque burns to his body, including his face, entire chest, and hands. The tar lugger was designed, manufactured, and marketed by Cleesby Manufacturing. Jim Share proved that this high-low lugger was dangerously designed, manufactured, and marketed. Jim knows how to make sure juries understand how injuries can truly devastate a person's personal and professional life. In representing all his clients, Jim won't be outworked, and he will not rest until justice is done for his clients. His results speak for themselves. Jim has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best trial lawyers in El Paso, in Texas, and in the nation. And because of that, he is driven to fight for people who have been harmed by the willful or negligent actions of others. Jim has built a substantial reputation nationwide by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down. And his amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide his clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from El Paso, Texas. It is my great pleasure to introduce Jim Sher and Roberto Oaxaca. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. We're here in El Paso, right across the border. Tell us a little bit about your firm and some of the cases and specialties you have, Jim. Uh, our law firm's been here for, since, for me since 1976, and Sher Legate's been around in name since 1992. We're the largest plaintiff firm representing victims uh, really between Houston and L.A. Uh, we have 12 attorneys, we have about 40 to 50 employees, and our whole purpose is to help human beings that really need the help, that would mm -hmm. never have that opportunity if it wasn't for firms like ours that work on what is called a contingent fee, right. to take on their claim and to fight the big corporations and the insurance companies to make certain that, that they get their justice. Right. We've covered other stories that your firm has handled, cases, and I see the one continuing thread is that almost in every single case you have a lot of Hispanic people, Spanish-speaking people, who couldn't get representation from any other law firm. Generally, they've been severely injured, 
uh, there has been a great injustice happen to them, and you guys are able to pull the rabbit out of the hat. How do you do that? Well, we represent a, a great number, and probably 95% of our, our cl clients are Hispanic. Yeah. And we have great relations, the ability to speak in Spanish and right. English. Uh, we represent government, uh, respectfully, uh, certain entities that help us get uh, people and evidence from Mexico and even clients that live in Mexico authorization to come into the United States when the wrongs have been done to them. But you also have very good resources to investigate cases like the bus case that we'll talk about in another story where nobody else has access to this, right? That's absolutely true. Now, today we're here talking about a case, Santos Rodriguez, and you were one of the co-counsels on here, Roberto. So tell our audience a little bit about what happened in this case and what happened to Santos. Uh, on March the 11th of 2008, uh, Santos Rodriguez was working uh, uh, on a roof and uh, he was severely uh, burned mm -hmm. by a tar lugger mm -hmm. that exploded um, uh, completely um, unexpected to him, of course. Uh, he had no idea that, that this could ever happen to him and he was severely burned. By mm -hmm. this incident, most a lot of law firms wouldn't take cases like this. Why? It's expensive. Yeah. The theory, legal theories, are very difficult. Uh -huh. the, f the fight involved is enormous. Yeah. Uh, developing a product liability case is a, a very hard undertaking. Right. Let's talk about the legal theories. What was your legal strategy to successfully do this case? Fortunately, there's a, a law in civil justice called product liability mm -hmm. law. Uh, it comes in under the rest restatement of torts. And that uh, provides that a manufacturer of a product uh, has a duty to make certain that that product is safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there's a design defect, a ma manufacturing defect, or a marketing defect, the manufacturer can be held liable. Mm -hmm. Even if the, the manufacturer didn't know uh, that it was defective because the manufacturer is placed with the duty to do a reasonable investigation of the reasonably foreseeable uses to which right. that product will be used. And in this particular case, the reasonable assumption that the manufacturer should have made is that when that spigot gets jammed up, the workers up there might tilt it to get the tar out, right? Well, that was actually in their uh, literature. It they, was. What did it say exactly? It, it said... Uh, uh, if it, it gets jammed, tilt it? No. no um, it, it says, it says uh, don't tilt it. Don't tilt it. <laughs> you know, uh, but unfortunately, those, those instructions were filled with tar. Yeah. Those, those I mean, warnings. It was on the outside of the container. Right. On right. The, on the container. And it, it was only in English, right? Right. It was only in English, and so um, it, it, it was ineffective, of course. Yeah. Um, tell us what happened in the case. How long did it take, by the way? Well, it, the incident took place in 2008. We brought a uh, lawsuit within the two-year statute of limitations, and it didn't get resolved till late uh, 2000. It got resolved almost four years later. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a lengthy undertaking with a lot of work being involved. Yeah. Now, you settled the case before you went to trial, right? Yes. I would assume it's a confidential settlement. Uh, maybe. Okay, why does a manufacturer settle before trial? Because the risks of trial yeah. are greater than the uh, ability to settle for a yeah. finite sum. Well, for our audience, uh, how do you make the information that you have accumulated in your discovery and in your presentation, how do you make it available to the manufacturer or to the other side so that they say, hey, well, wait a minute, we might lose this case? Well. The manufacturer has every bit of the evidence that was developed in this case. Right. They have the expert reports, like from Dr. Huerta. They've got the studies, the, the examples. They've got the evidence. Yeah. Uh, so they absolutely have full knowledge of what took place in this case. But they had another case, I think it was in South Carolina, where they went to trial and they won. Well, they had all that same information, too. Why did they win there? Okay, they, they basically won in that, in that case because... Uh, they were they were successfully they would they were successfully enabled to argue that uh, this this product uh, they couldn't 
this for this misuse was not foreseeable to them uh, in 1997. But they couldn't argue that in in our case in 2008 because by that time it was foreseeable because it had happened before. Right. So the fact that it, in, an incident had happened before was reason enough for them to make a safety change, right? Yes, sir. So it, the so the real big question is, and we do cases like this all the time, have they made that safety change? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. So there's other incidents out there. And this is one of the reasons why we do a show, because you know, you as a trial lawyer, both of you as trial lawyers, when you go before a jury, there's going to be some jurors that are going to say, hey, it was the guy's fault. He should have read it. They're not seeing the fact that it was covered up. They don't know whether these workers were not instructed about not tilting it, were they? I'm sure they weren't. There was no like safety instruction orientation, was there? Well, and, and the thing is, is that this handle uh, yeah. that, that they uh, would tilt the lugger with, it's, it's kind of invites you to do that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you just automatically, you're going you're gonna to think, well, I, I can tilt that. And yeah. It's okay. It's yeah. okay to do that. Um, right now, we have with us the expert that you used in your case, Dr. Michael Huerta. So let's bring him on right now. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Huerta. We have in front of us a high-low lugger, correct? Uh, yes, we do. It's actually a quarter-scale model okay. of the subject uh, tar lugger. Okay. In this case, the high-low lugger was improperly designed, and as a result of that, the client, Santos Rodriguez, was severely injured. You're showing us this uh, quarter-scale uh, example for the purposes of showing how it should work or what happened. I'm using the, uh, this quarter-scale model for the purpose of explaining what happened in okay. the incident. Please, please explain. Uh, yes, uh, these uh, tar luggers are used on flat roofs, and they transport 400-degree molten tar. And how much tar is in one of these cylinders? Uh, there's 55 gallons wow. of tar. There's a lot of tar. It's, it's, yeah. it's at a very high temperature. It's like, what, 400 degrees? Oh, or around 400 degrees at Fahrenheit. And it stays at that temperature? Uh, it stays at that temperature for quite a while. Okay. It, it has to be at that temperature to, um, so that it uh, does not develop a high viscosity. Right. So that it can be, when the spigot is open, it will pour mm -hmm. into buckets. Right. And then it can mop the roof with it. What were the design problems with the uh, high-low lugger that was being used and manufactured by Cleesby? Yes. Well, the design problem is that um, when workers tilted, and it's foreseeable they can tilt it because it's provided with a long handle. When, when workers tilt, uh, the subject lug lugger, I'm talking about a full-scale lugger, yeah. they will lift up on this handle, and uh, after they tilt it a few degrees, uh, there is an unvented space towards the back of the lugger. It's a void space mm -hmm. and it has no vent. And since um, tar is a, is a byproduct of um, the process whereby gasoline is uh, refined, uh, it can em emit uh, gasoline vapors. So uh, the tar uh, can emit a very, uh, an explosive mixture. Right. Uh, of course, the mixture has to be correct. So the design, for the design problem, there was no vent. Is that correct? Uh, there's no vent, and, and un, a large void space mm -hmm. is formed right here. You may be able to see that. Yeah. How do you make this better? Have a vent space? Uh, well, a safer alternative is to um, um, build an upper structure whereby that unvented void never occurs. Yeah. And uh, I discussed that in my report. Right. The safer alternative is called a guard lock, and there's any number of safer alternatives. Usually, uh, in a product's case, uh, there's any number of safer, safer alternatives yeah. that should have been discovered when the hazards analysis is performed. Right. Do you, you both of you don't know whether Cleese B has changed the, the engineering of this uh, lugger, do you? Yes, I, I personally do not. <clears throat> so this could happen again, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what happened was, didn't they tilt it up when this thing jammed up? Uh, yes. Uh, and it, when they show us, when they tilted uh, it up, yes. it exploded, uh, as, correct? As I mentioned earlier, yeah. uh, the structure is provided with, with a very long handle. Yeah. So it's relatively easy for workers to tilt it. Um, 
and they were uh, tilting it um, in order to pour pour um, molten tar out of this opening. Yeah. And so um, uh, I I would uh, say that that um, this tilting action by workers is very foreseeable. Yeah. It's a foreseeable action. But actually, the spigot was the actual designated place where the tar is supposed to come out, the molten that is, tar. That is correct. The one at the top would probably where they poured it in, correct? That is correct. Uh, okay. Now, the NAF National Safety Council, don't they have guidelines for the manufacture of products like this where accidents happen? Uh, yes, they, they do have guidelines. What's their guidelines? But they're general guidelines. There's no specific standard that says you shall design a yeah. tar lugger to these specs. Right. Okay. But the general guidelines are that um, before placing a, a product into the stream of commerce, mm -hmm. a thorough hazards analysis mm -hmm. should be performed. Mm -hmm. And the hazards analysis should reveal um, potential hazards with the, with the product um, based on foreseeable use and also foreseeable misuse, right. keeping in mind that workers may have lapses in concentration. Sure. So uh, the designer should foresee possible errors right. and possi possible misuse of the product. And then the goal, the, uh, the goal is to design out the hazard, right. make design changes to eliminate the hazard. Sure. That is the goal. And if, if it's economically and technologically feasible to do so, then it's incumbent on the designer to make those changes, to design out the hazard. So in this case, and in most cases, uh, warnings are not sufficient. They're certainly not sufficient when the hazard can be designed out. If it's at all technologically and economically feasible right. to design out the hazard, it should be done. And in most cases, the cost is trivial. We also have your client here, Santos Rodriguez. So let's bring him on right now. I want to thank you for being with us today, Santos. I see you have your translator here, uh, Elizabeth. Tell our audience the pain and the suffering that you have gone through as a result of this horrible accident. Okay. I felt a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. What can't you do today that you used to be able to do? What are you missing in your life? Antes caminaba mucho y ahora casi no puedo caminar por el por el cuello. I used to walk for long distances and now I can do that because of as a result of my injury. You're no longer working. You can't work, right? No, no. trabaja, verdad? No, I can't. Okay. Are you angry with the contractor for having such a badly designed piece of equipment and what happened to you? Sí. Yes, I am. Okay. What do you want to say? to the people that employed you before about how you got treated? Mm. That they should be more careful with their employees. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you very much for being on the program and I hope your life is a better life and you get better. What should you do when you get injured on a job? What you should immediately do? What you should do? Well, obviously, you should get uh, your medical treatment first. Yeah. You need to get your your uh, injury taken care of by medical professionals. Uh -huh. uh, but after that, of course, uh, you should con uh, seek legal help. Right. You have a lot of cases since you've been in El Paso for so long. You have a lot of people contact you regarding cases. How do you choose your cases, and how do you choose your clients? Well, first off, we talk to the person individually and understand their ability to explain what happened and how it occurred. And we look at the, the severity of the injuries and tragedy that occurred and then look at what w can we do to help them. What are the laws? What are their rights? Uh, what are the difficulties? Right. And, and then uh, and what are the injuries? Putting right. it all together after that evaluation, then we take the case okay. or we turn it down. We actually turn down probably 95% of the cases that really? come in. Uh, a, uh, for many different reasons, we end up turning down a lot more cases than we take. Mm -hmm. uh, so when someone initially comes into your law firm, 
and they tell you what happened to them. You have to do a full-scale investigation, basically, to find out whether there's a legal cause of action, whether it's going to be a case you want to get involved with, right? Well, that comes afterwards. Mm -hmm. The first thing is accepting the case. Yes. And you do that on your initial client interview, yeah. generally. Uh, and then f from there you get in to do the full-scale investigation and your case development mm -hmm. because there's a lot of factors that go into mm -hmm. presenting a case at trial. Well, you guys did a great job and um, your client certainly appreciates it. So we want to thank you very much for being on the program today and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.